to be here as an application security professional. Um, can't tell you uh, what an honor it is to be here in front of you today and to share this time with you. So again, good morning. It, this morning has gotten off to a very bumpy start. I don't know about all of you in the room, but we flew in last night. I brought my family with me. Um, my wife is originally from the Bay Area, we're coming from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so I got my six month old son, who is my role model, my idol, but a six month old on a plane for five hours is rough. And then we've got a four and a half year old who is a lot to handle. So we got in late last night, and I made a huge mistake this morning. Um, we decided to kind of stay north of here so that she could visit her family and I could come down. And I forgot about 8.80 in the morning. <laughs> so for me to be here today is huge. For you all to take time out of your day to come and sit and have this conversation with me means the world. I'm hopeful that um, the stuff I'm going to show you today um, at some really cool things we've done at Domino's uh, allows you to be able to go back to your respective organizations and if you're interested in solving the same types of problems uh, that this is helpful, helpful to you. I'm going to try to move through this, this information as quickly as I can to, to allow for time for questions. And again, I hope this is something that you all really enjoy. Um, so, uh, with that being said, my name is Mike Shepard. Um, I lead the application security program over at Domino's, and a lot of people, including myself, when I started at Domino's, are like, Domino's has an asset program? I'm like, why? So we do. I'm living proof of that. Uh, we actually have a really, in my mind, very impressive uh, development organization. We do a lot around innovation, and some of the stuff I'm going to show you really speaks to that. I like to always kind of start off my talks by um, just kind of getting something out of the way. And forgive me, I know it's early. I've only had one cup of coffee. But we just need to get, we need to get over this, this one thing. I need to know, just by show of hands, how many folks came to this talk today hoping for Domino's Pizza? <laughs> just be honest, please. We always have a few. Sorry. At least it was my Lord coming. <laughs> and then I'm telling you, every time I talk, I talk and I'm just like, let's just get it over here. <laughs> uh, we're working on it. A lot of times when we try to plan to do that, we can mention folks that are like, well, you're selling it for $7.99, so we're going to add $100. <laughs> that, that happened. Um, so again, what I want to talk about with you all today is a, a, a big problem um, that we had at Domino's. Um, and I've worked at a number of very large enterprises over the last two years leading AppSec programs. And from my experience, this has been a problem at many large enterprises, and it's really around um, security engagement. So as development teams, uh, our fine development professionals look to build really innovative, important, software, how do they engage security right in a really meaningful and valuable way? Um, and so at Domino's, this was a huge issue for us, right? Because if development teams don't engage security, there's potentially risk that's exposed to the business, right? Um, and so this was a problem that we had at Domino's, and really, honestly, this has been an issue uh, at every organization that I've worked at. The second part of my conversation, you guys are lucky, is um, I'm going to show you at the end of the day, uh, in downloads, what we've done to really visualize security, right? Because it's important to do security, it's important to provide value in terms of from security, but, but what does the security posture of a development organization look like at the end of the day, right? So you understand what needs to be done to mitigate risk. And so, um, one of the things that we're known for at Domino's is that we're number one in pizza delivery. And I always think that's interesting that we say in pizza delivery, right? Because that means that somebody else might be number one in other things. But most of us in the room, just show of hands, how many of you have had Domino's? Very nice. Our CEO would be very happy to see that. We have this saying at Domino's, how 
How many enjoyed the Domino's experience? Okay. Yeah. You guys remember, I'm going to use some, some terminology here, please. I hope no one's offended. I, got, I get in trouble a lot at work. I actually got in trouble the day before coming here. Um, and I'm starting to kind of realize sometimes you have to get in trouble to do a good job, right? Um, so my CISO said, Mike, you're going to do this last talk, and you have to promise me you're not going to. He was serious. He said, uh, you're not going to say anything bad about Domino's, right? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know why they think I would. But we have this saying that Domino's, like, oh, yes, we did, right? Because we like to do really cool things around innovation. And so when you look at Domino's, Domino's, when I came to Domino's, there was this kind of this thought around we're not a pizza company, we're a technology company that sells pizza products, right? And when you look at a lot of the innovations, the things that we've done with technology, that is true. Uh, most of you have seen Pizza Tracker if you've ordered pizza. Like, I'm extremely dependent on that, right? Like, we ordered pizza from another company last night. We do order from other companies at times, and the pizza never showed up. And I was anxious and nervous, like, you know, where's the pizza at? So Pizza Tracker solves that problem for us. You guys have probably recently seen we do, we're, we're toying with the idea of, of self-driving delivery, right? Autonomous vehicles, part of the report. I'm not 100% sure about that, but <laughs> I'm not, I'm just being honest. You know, the car just shows up and you put your code in and you look it around and your pizza's there. Um, but that's the future of pizza delivery. You can text, you can do Alexa. There's all these really cool, cutting edge ways to order pizza, right? And so that's Domino's. Um, we have over 14,000 stores worldwide. That number is growing every day. We are in uh, over 85 international markets. And again, that number increases every day. And lastly, this is uh, one of the reasons I, I wanted to put this on this slide is this is an astounding fact. Domino's generates or derives almost $6 billion of its annual revenue through digital means. So people are engaging and buying from Domino's digitally to a tune of $6 billion a year. And so when you think about that, there's a heavy reliance on development, right? To do that is, is really very impressive. So when I say I get in trouble, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, so we had this huge critical problem in Domino's. Development teams were building these cutting edge innovations, but were not incorporating and working with security teams to identify risks, provide security requirements, and really build secure software, right? So that's a recipe for, for disaster in terms of a breach, compromises, types of things. And so we had a problem. Our problem was essentially that our security engagement process sucked. Okay, I kind of said it that way. I got in trouble for saying that. Um, but it's true, it sucked. And so in the late 90s, early 2000s, you guys will remember Domino's kind of changed their business because they came out. We had this tenant where it's based around uncommon honesty. Like, our pizza really sucks. <laughs> Probably shouldn't be. And so Domino's said that, right? Like, does anybody remember when they came out with those ads? Like, before you, you know, this commercial, our pizza sucks. And the sauce does. But so they, uncommon honesty, they admitted that and we changed it, right? And today we have a pretty good product. Like I like Domino's pizza. So, so our problem was that our, our security engagement process sucked. Development teams didn't engage us. Uh, we didn't have visibility. They didn't know who to engage. They didn't know why to engage us. They didn't understand the value. So they just didn't engage us and they're building things with a lot of vulnerabilities in it and they're, they're promoting this stuff in production and now Domino's has all this risk. And so because our engagement uh, process sucked, very few teams wanted to engage us. I gave a talk at Atlassian around this problem and, and my handler at Atlassian said, you know, what? you guys are security engagement process kind of reminded me of this, this, this uh, quote from the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. How many of you folks are familiar with that book? That's the other thing. I get to these talks and people are like, yeah, we've heard of that. I've, I've never heard of the book. I, I probably
promise folks I will read the book. <laughs> but the quote, I saw the quote and I said, that sounds like our engagement process. So this is kind of a summary of what our security engagement process was like. And I'll read it. So they wouldn't even lift a finger to save their own grandmothers from the ravenous mudblotter beast of Chaw without order signed in triplicate, sent in, sent back, queried, lost, found, subjugated to public inquiry, lost again, and finally buried in soft heat for three months and recycled as firelighters. I would not want to mess with that, right? Like I'm not, if that's their process, I'm not a part of that. And so that's what our process was like. It was just this really dysfunctional, uh, inefficient, ineffective thing that made no sense. And so development teams stayed away from it, right? And so when I came to the Domino's, this is one of the very first things I identified as a gap. I said, we need to change that, we need to solve it. And again, this is a problem I've seen across most major enterprises. So just to quickly summarize, our previous security engagement process was broken. Um, it was very manual, uh, it was very inefficient. It, there were meetings, and more meetings, and some more meetings, and if you want to meet again, we can meet again, right? Does that sound like anybody's life? If you want to meet again, we can meet after lunch. And you're like, for what? <laughs> um, so, oftentimes in my career, people would want to meet. We had just hours, hundreds of hours, wasted with people talking and really no action. There was no alignment and no visibility. People didn't know how to consume security uh, services for the benefit of the company. Today, by introducing this solution that I'm gonna showcase for you guys, our new security engagement solution, we now have something that's integrated, it's streamlined, it's automated, and it, and it allows you to monitor it, which is really the power. Is, is to look at the, the outcome, the results. And so, this thing that we were able to build was actually uh, through leveraging uh, Atlassian's Confluence product, uh, which is a, a wiki type of tool, similar to SharePoint. Uh, a lot of the early development at Domino's happens around Confluence, when they're looking to uh, develop and document requirements, workflows, these types of things. Um, leveraging Jira, which is our primary um, uh, bug uh, defect tracker, and then lastly Splunk and Splunk's ITSI uh, product, which allows us to uh, produce a KPI managed dashboard to visualize the security posture of our development organization. And so, how did we do this? Well, I didn't see this, but we, hopefully that process is supposed to be over the right. So, so, I said something negative, like our security engagement process sucked, right? You never tell your kid they suck. Some people do. Um, <laughs> those sports guys, you, you suck. You gotta get better. Um, so how did we unsuck our security process? One of the things I've learned over my career is, like a lot of times in security, we build security things with the right intentions, but we build them the way we want to build them, where we want to build them, and then we go back to the development organization and say, you guys have to come over here and use this security thing, right? And so what we've proven, and what I've seen over my career is that that does not work, right? And so my approach and our approach at Domino's was to build on top of the existing development process. Do things where they live, do things, build this, this process uh, in alignment with their existing process, right? And so the very first thing we did is identify where do our developers live? Where do they work? Well, in Domino's, they work at Com on Confluence and Jira. And so that's where we built uh, the first part of this solution, the risk form piece. It's an actual form that's built on Confluence, and it really asks eight critical security questions to development teams. Hey, is this thing that you're building, this API, um, this web application, is it web-facing? Does it handle sensitive data? Does it talk to a database? Is it under any type of regulatory oversight, PCI, these types of things? And by taking in that data, uh, we were able on the back end to build a, a risk handler that automatically logics this data from a risk perspective, then creates security requirement tickets and assigns them out to service providers. So we created the form on Confluence. Uh, using adaptiveness forms for Confluence, we asked 
the eight critical security questions that we thought were most important to understand. Uh, we partnered with uh, a company, uh, an Atlassian partner, to build this risk handler on, uh, on uh, Jira. I'll show you in just a minute, and it does the risk decisioning. Um, it creates tickets and assigns them out to uh, the uh, service providers. And then lastly, we were able to, to take all that rich data, right, from folks filling out this, this risk form, getting back these security requirements tickets, we're able to take all that data now and visualize it in Splunk. And I'll show you that in just a minute. I'm sorry this slide is, is, is so messy. Um, we'll hop through this. And so this is what the risk form looks like. Uh, it's very blurry in here, and I don't know why, but uh, essentially this form is created on Confluence. The very first thing that it does is it pre-populates with your, your AD credentials. It knows who you are. You're the reporter. And so what you're going to do is you're going to provide the application or service name for the thing you're building. Under that, you're going to provide the Jira project key that this development is, it belongs to. Uh, after that, there, that's a question over to the left. Hey, is this thing that you're building web-facing? Yes or no? Um, does it fall under any type of regulatory oversight? Example, PCI. Uh, does, it, does it utilize any risky or sensitive HTTP methods such as post, put, or delete? Yes. One of the things that we found um, from building this risk form is it actually became an opportunity to provide a awareness training to our project managers, to our development leads, to our developers, because as they were filling the form out, it intuitively kind of spoke to them and said, hey, I'm answering yes to a lot of these bad things. This thing that I'm building is kind of risky. I do need security. And so we actually started to get that input from our development <laughs> folks. And I thought that was powerful. And so you'll we'll answer more questions. Hey, are you sending data out to third parties? Um, lastly, you get an area to provide a confluence link uh, where we can go and learn more about this particular development. And then lastly, special notes. I always thought special notes was interesting because it shows you a lot about people. Like, we've had people go on special notes and say some weird things. Right? Like, like trust me, you want to pen test this thing. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think the form is really cool. Uh, and then an area for business logic. People are very interested, you know. So, <laughs> so there are two ways that the, the, the application that we built on Jira works, right? Over to the left, there, there is a weighting. There's a, a score that's specifically tied to a question, right? So like, is it public facing? Um, yes. Then there's a score of five there. It's, it's, a, it's a heavier weight, right? And so there is a security requirement ticket that may be um, created specifically tied to a specific question. Um, the other type of security requirement ticket and the way in which it's, it's generated is a, 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 a total security score, right? So as you fill out or as you answer these eight questions, there's a total score that's taken. And based off of that total score, you fall within a risk range from low to critical. And based off of where you fall, there are, uh, by default, a certain number of security tickets, requirements tickets that may be created in a sign out, right? Uh, and an example would be secure coding, gui uh, secure coding guidelines to me. One of the cool things that is a, an outcome of the form is a receipt. Because think about it, when you engage, there's no record, right? When you talk to a development team, you just go in a room, you meet, you know, they ask you questions, you give them answers. And at the end of the day, there's no receipt, right? And so one of the things that we did is say, okay, as a record over time, we want to take and provide you kind of an output of what you told us about your development, right? So if you tell us lies or you misrepresent things, in the future if there's an issue, we can hold you accountable, right? I'm not saying you have to hold developers accountable, but this is me. Um, so this is what an actual um, security requirements ticket looks like for a web app pen test today. And we're colorizing this thing so that everything doesn't bleed in to one another. But what this ticket does is it says, hey, this is a web application pen test ticket. This is what's required. This is who's responsible for what. And what's really cool, now most 
few folks in here, I'm assuming are security folks. So I'm gonna have to change what I say to developers. Um, but the security people didn't really like the SLA piece, right? Um, because rarely have we had SLAs to deliver services. It's always been the other way around, where the development teams do. But now because of our forum, we have three business days to respond back to the folks that have, uh, to the folks that own this ticket. Three business days. You have to reach out and engage and say, hey, you need a pen test, I need to sit with you and understand what you're doing uh, to determine whether or not you need a pen test. The InfoSec folks pulled me in a room and said, man, you're not cool. <laughs> I said, guys, I said, this is good for us. We can show value. And they're like, Mike, no one's smiling like this is not funny. Um, so they, they, they've gotten used to it. Uh, it's funny, when I asked them, I said, oh, well, what do you guys think is an acceptable turnaround for SLA, right? They got quiet. It's crickets. We don't need SLAs, right? So we have an SLA to respond to that. And guess what? The development organization loves this. And so does security, right? Because it provides parameters on the engagement process. I'm almost done. Uh, I'm going to show you this dashboard. I think the dashboard is really the coolest thing. So as a result, of this, this engagement automation. Like what's been, wow, the numbers are low. Okay, no, no, no. I saw the zeros. <laughs> this is really one of those days. <laughs> How do I, okay, so we got to do nothing as an outcome. Um, so right, the data speaks for itself. And I think most of you in the room that are security folks, most of you that care about secure software development, most of you that care about value, Derived from security to development, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road, right? So as a result of having this solution in place for 18 months, we've had over 400 submissions to our form. And for me, this is very powerful, right? right? It's like when your child is born, having a child, is you see the child, you know the child, you love the child. This is real. So prior to this form, we didn't have this data, right? We didn't know that we were engaging folks you know, 400 times, right? And so we know today, uh, over the last 18 months, we've had 400 submissions into our risk form. So we've had the opportunity to mitigate risk 400 times. That's amazing. We've had over 2,000 tickets created as a result of this form. We've had 800 engagements open. And so what that means is just because you get a security requirement ticket does not necessarily mean that there will be an engagement. The service provider may you know, say, hey, you're, you're good, you don't need a pen test. We've had over 600 engagements closed. Think about that. Think about all that risk that's been mitigated. We've had 4,000 requirements met. From pen test to security engagement, I forgot what that meant. He holds up the thing for 10 minutes. I'm almost done, I gotta speed through it. Um, he's like, you, you're, talk, you're talking too much. Um, 4,000 security requirements met, and then lastly, um, you know, this is a reality, all security requirements don't always get met. So we've got 320 open and outstanding security requirements. One of the things we've learned is that requirements sometimes stay open because folks don't have money for a pen test. Folks don't believe their requirement needs to be met. So there's a reason for requirements not being met. As a result of this thing, and I'll move to the dashboard, as a result of this exercise and this new automated process, we now have something that's standardized, easy, and fast. Right? That's good security. Good security advisors. We have something that's standard. It's easy. It's what? It's fast. I had a, a project manager say, man, I use that formula for a couple of minutes. I said, yeah, man. And he kept staring at me. I was like, what do you want? Like, hey, you want something more? He's like, I just think it's so cool. So security is cool. As a result of this, this, this automation, uh, we've had other internal business teams say, hey, we can use that, that thing you built to solve problems um, for our business units. Uh, at Dowdless Finance Income, our project management office, our site reliability engineer folks, and our stock have all taken this solution and utilized it to solve problems specific to their use cases. So now what do we do, right? What security do we want? We can get another problem. I don't. I like to do nothing, right? So now what do we do? We've built this thing. 
you know, is streamlined and, and automated. So now what? Now it's time to monitor, right? What's happening over the next 18 months? Let's understand the data. And so what we've done at Domino's is we've taken Splunk's ITSI, right? For me, being a security person for over 10 years now, we've come so far in terms of controls and capabilities, really across the developed life cycle. Now it's time to visualize the security posture of the development organization, right? Across seven really critical KPIs. And so what we have now at Domino's is I can go to our e-commerce development leader, leaders, and I can say, hey, right now you guys have a composite security score for the e-com development. E-com at Domino's is your Domino's.com, right? And in all of the underlying microservices, <coughs> we have those that make up your Domino's.com experience. And so for all of those services and that front end for development, you have a score of 35, which is low. It's super rare. It's critical. Okay? And that's zero to 100. And so well, why, is, why, why do we have a 35? Why is it red? What needs to be fixed? And so when you look to the right, and you guys can't see it, and I'm sorry for that, that very first KPI, that 85%, is scan coverage, both static and dynamic, across all services. Okay? And so your score is predicated on your scan coverage. If we're scanning everything, that's good. Your next KPI is met security requirements. We're changing that or have changed that to security compliance. Out of the number of security requirements tickets that you have open, how many are being closed over a period of time across what number of services or applications? To the right from there, you have, and in this instance, this example looks pretty good. Next you have, um, uh, this is my favorite one, open vulnerabilities. On average, high and critical across all of your development. And this number would say you've got 4.5 high and critical open and outstanding vulnerabilities over, I think, 30 days. We all know in this room that's unacceptable. Developer folks don't. Okay, tell them that it's not good. Um, the next one is we have a tool that runs in our IDE called Secure Assist. Some of you may be familiar with Secure Assist. It's alerting our developers in real time uh, to bad things that they may introduce into a code base. And so on average, this is saying that three on average, um, open, uh, high and critical vulnerabilities that developers are being alerted to that they're not resolving while developing. That's not good. Next to that, you have mean time to resolution. On average, and these numbers are examples, let me make that disclaimer. I see so in like the second data. Um, so on average, it takes 90 days to fix the vulnerability in our code base. The next one is a WAF correlation KPI. The vulnerabilities we have in our code base that we know about versus the malicious traffic that we see for a service trying to exploit that vulnerability. And this actually shows you a static number. Lastly, and we all know this is a huge problem around development, is uh, risk to third party and open source libraries. So on average, we've got 46 uh, open, critical, and high vulnerabilities across our open, our third party and open source libraries. These folks now have the ability on their own to understand where they need to go to mitigate risk, right? And how they need to do it, where resources need to go. The dashboard of those KPIs drill down into actual services across your development uh, repo. So you understand maybe not every service is a problem. Some in particular have more issues than others. And then from there, and I love this because developers, their models are just wide open. You can drill down to the actual tickets that you want to talk about. It. And they say, no, mate, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough, like, calm down. You can look at your services holistically and their related security score. And then lastly, you can look at an actual service across the SDLC um, and in all of the different APIs down to tickets. We've saved over 3,000 hours um, by automating this process. Saved almost 500 k from folks not wasting time anymore. And we've reduced risk analysis 75% as a result of this automation. Um, so always look to automate when you can, empower each other, pick good partners in life too, and monitor and show your metrics.
Thank you. You guys already know security is everyone's job. Thank you.